dance music. <laughs> uh, so, hi, I'm Amy, um, and I am currently a senior UX lead at Shopify. I work on the app, the partner platform team. Um, but before that, I worked on the design systems team here at Shopify and worked on the launch of Polaris, uh, which is uh, Shopify's design system. So I'm not going to talk too much about myself in this slide, um, except to say that I come from a content strategy background. So this project process that I'm going to talk about really came, comes through that lens of coming from a content strategy background. And one of the things that I really love about Shopify is that it takes a multidisciplinary and holistic approach to UX. And it's a world where somebody from a content strategy background like me can end up leading a UX team. Um, and this is just a little bit about some of the work that we did on Polaris. So first of all, why might somebody want to build a design system? I think it's because life is complicated. And it's complicated in all kinds of different ways. So if you're working at a company, you're probably dealing with this type of complexity, platform complexity, user complexity, and organizational complexity. So what am I talking about when I talk about platform complexity? So at Shopify, we have a commerce product, and it shows on every kind of device size you can imagine. Um, we also have Shopify Plus. Woo! Woo! Shopify Plus. <laughs> we have a range of apps that we also develop, um, such as Frenzy, which allows people to basically do flash sales anywhere in the world. We have a point of sale system. Um, and we also have a network of thousands and thousands of developers and partners, all of who are building apps to integrate within Shopify. So it's a pretty complicated world. And as a UX team, we are always thinking about different ways to manage and mitigate that complexity. And then we're also dealing with user complexity. So at Shopify, over 400,000 businesses are powered by our platform. And that represents over a million active merchants who are running their business using Shopify. And these merchants are absolutely diverse. They're from all over the world. They speak different languages. Um, some of them sell their stuff at farmer's markets. Some of them have actual brick and mortar retail locations. Um, some of them sell online. Some of them just sell through Amazon or Facebook. So they all have incredibly complicated and diverse needs. And we need to again, manage that complexity as we're thinking about the products that we build. And then finally, we're dealing with a lot of organizational complexity. So at Shopify, we've got multiple international audiences, or sorry, offices. Hello, welcome, come in. <laughs> um, we've got remote workers who are uh, all over the place. Our main offices are here in Waterloo, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, um, and then we have remote people located in all kinds of places, and we have thousands and thousands of, thousands of employees, so we're managing an incredibly diverse workforce that is distributed. And all of this can feel super overwhelming. You're going to see a lot of gifts in this presentation. <laughs> um, it can feel really overwhelming, and um, one of the ways of managing some of that overwhelm is by building a design system. But often when people talk about building a design system, this is really what they mean. Design systems are a really hot thing right now. People like them. There are websites devoted to beautiful design systems. Beautiful style guides is really what they are. Um, and it's really easy to become distracted by the shiny thing. And it's really easy to forget that the piece that we talk the most about, which is the style guide, is just the piece that is the tip of the iceberg. It's the thing that's sticking up out of the water that we can look at, it shines in the sun. Um, but it's really, really easy to forget all the depth, all the stuff that's beneath the surface that is really what makes a style guide or design system effective. And I'm going to talk about some of those things today. So without the right approach, a style guide may actually reinforce unproductive and unhelpful ways of working. So if you're with a team and you just focus on building the shiny thing, the tip of the iceberg, what you may end up doing is building something that isn't actually really effective and doesn't actually help you manage any of that complexity. So when we worked on Polaris, 
which launched last year in April 2017 at our developer conference Unite, we really wanted to make sure that our design system had a strong foundation. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things we did and some of our approaches. So just to underscore this point, Polaris is our style guide. It's not representative of our entire design system. It's a map of the tangible elements of our system as it exists today. And you can view Polaris at polaris.shopify.com. So our design system is much bigger than just our style guide. It's much bigger than Polaris. It's the water we swim in. And I'm a literary nerd. Uh, I studied English and Women's Studies in university. And I love this quote by David Foster Wallace because I think it really represents the invisibility and the largeness of, a, of what makes up a design system. So it says, there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, the hell is water? And that's kind of like our design system. Um, whether or not you have a beautiful style guide, you are, cre if you're creating products, if you're designing products, you have a system, you have a way that you're working, you have a way that you're getting things done. It might be dysfunctional, but it exists. Um, and so when we talk about the things that make up our design system and how we really understand what that means, how we make sure that we've got a strong foundation, we really focused our time on all that stuff that lives under the water. This is the stuff that you don't see when you go to the shiny website. Uh, so we focused on understanding the purpose. So what was it that we were trying to accomplish by building out a design system, by being intentional, by making that water more visible? Um, and we then assembled and empowered a team of experts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means um, and also how multidisciplinary that team was. Um, and we created an inventory of the tangible and intangible elements of our system so that we could really understand it. Um, and then the last step, the shiny part, was we actually built the style guide. So let's start with the murky underwater business of understanding the problem that we're trying to solve. So we mostly did this by asking a lot of questions. So, um, and not just within our design systems team, but also across the company. So people were absolutely building and shipping great products at Shopify. And we really wanted to understand what processes they were using, what systems they were using. Um, so we really wanted to know how is our system working today. Without all of this documentation, without this style guide, how are people understanding how to get things done? Who are the primary audiences for our design system at Shopify? And at Shopify, it's a little bit complicated because it's our internal audience. It's, it's all the people who build product. Um, but it's also an external audience of developers and partners who all build apps and channels that integrate with Shopify, um, and which is the main reason that we made our style guide public. And then um, we also wanted to talk a little bit about how might a design system change how we would work. So it's one thing to just build a shiny, it's, a, it's one thing to build a shiny style guide. But I think it's really important to think about the reason that you're doing it and the things that you actually want to change about how you're approaching your design process. So at Shopify, um, there were a few things that really led us to tackle this work in a serious way. So one of those things was we were doing a visual redesign of our product. Um, if I, how many of you use Shopify? Are any of you familiar with it? A couple people, okay, okay, well. For those of you who don't use it, um, in, I think it was June of last year, we did a pretty big visual refresh. Um, Shopify got a lot more purple than it was before, um, and there were a lot of other uh, functional changes, but um, we were dealing with all of those different interfaces and apps and organizational complexity and all that stuff I talked about earlier, and we had to figure out a way to get everybody moving in the same direction for this large-scale visual redesign. Um, as we looked across our products, it wasn't hard to tell that there were some key components that weren't uh, consistent. And for those of you that are not familiar with the term component, a component is basically just um, a building block, a piece of, uh, of our interface that gets kind of snapped together and repeated over and over again. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, also, we found ourselves having the same conversations over and over again. Um, just gonna skip ahead to this slide. So I mentioned I come from a content strategy background. 
Um, if any of you work in language, you will be familiar with this debate that happens all the time, which is, do we use the Oxford comma, also known as the serial comma, or do we not? Um, this was something that I felt like I was having a conversation about on a regular basis. So that kind of pointed to a need for some clear documentation about what we do. And by the way, we do use the Oxford comma at Chapel <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to go back here. Uh, and then the other piece that we found was um, there was some inconsistent documentation. So we have a resource here at Shopify that we call The Vault, and it's kind of like our intranet, and it's where we store all kinds of documentation um, about how we work. And as we looked through that documentation, we saw a lot of inconsistency, a lot of things that were out of date, a lot of things that didn't have an owner, um, some information that agreed with each other, and some information that, that just was very confusing. So. Again, all these things pointed to a need for us to really think about our design system, make it intentional, um, and then document it. So, um, as we were thinking about this purpose and the kind of problem we were solving and the results that we wanted to see, we kept coming back to these three words, quality, efficiency, and alignment. So we really wanted to build a higher quality product and um, a more consistent product that was easier for our merchants to use. We wanted to work more efficiently together and avoid having those conversations over and over again with each other. Um, and we also wanted to help build alignment. Um, we wanted to have a source of truth for how we approach um, our design practice. So the second thing I want to talk to you about, um, again, we're still under the, under the water, we're under, under the ocean, is um, assembling a multidisciplinary team of experts. And as the champion of this project, this was really inspiring to me. Um, because I've worked at other companies uh, in product where, as somebody from a content strategy background, I actually haven't felt very integrated into the design process. Um, I spent four years at Facebook, I was one of the first product content strategists there, and I learned so much, um, but I always felt like I was sort of fighting for a seat at the table. And at Shopify, we really believe the best products are built with a really holistic, multidisciplinary team approach. And so we really wanted to reflect that on our design systems team, and also, I mean, just the fact that somebody like me from a content strategy background could lead part of this project. Uh, I mean, I learned so much, and I felt really valued um, as a special disciplinary sort of contributor to this work. So if you want to build holistic products that are easy to understand and use, the members of your team need to be equipped with a breadth of UX skills. So that seems like a no-brainer, but in practice, it often doesn't happen. So when we talk about UX at Shopify, this is generally what we talk about. We're talking about design, we're talking about content strategy, uh, research and we're talking about front-end development. And we believe that this component of people working together, deeply integrated, results in the best user experience for our merchants. So we wanted to make sure that these disciplines were really, really well represented on the systems team, and not only well represented, but they were able to do their very best work. But, I love this GIF, this is the best GIF. Can we just give it a second, because it's, oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, but great players don't necessarily equal a great team. You have to be intentional when you put great players together. Um, and to make a great team, you need people who are more focused on how they work together rather than what their individual contribution is. Um, they need to share principles and approaches, and um, they need to learn how to leverage the unique skills of each player. So some of the ways we approach teamwork and really helped um, build a cohesive team that was able to launch uh, our style guide in actually a pretty short time um, were some of these things. So um, we really wanted people to embrace the ambiguity and overlap in UX roles. So when I talk about interface work, design work, and I talk about what designers do and what content strategists do and what front-end developers do um, and what researchers do, there's actually a lot of overlap and ambiguity between those roles. And it can be really easy to kind of dig down and try to carve out space by putting up walls around your discipline. Um, and we really didn't want people to do that. We really wanted people to be comfortable crossing into other swim lanes. We wanted designers 
and front end developers to feel comfortable contributing to the documentation and to feel like they were supported in being better writers. We wanted content strategists to be able to contribute to the wireframes. Um, we just really wanted people to, to work together. And in fact, we insisted on it. And some of the ways we did that were by doing things like holding cross-disciplinary sprints, critiques, and planning sessions. So we made sure that all the right people were in the room and that we're able to contribute and give feedback and just work together to make our product better. And importantly, if you're gonna, if you believe in multidisciplinary practice, it's really important for that multidisciplinarity to be reflected at the leadership level. So from the leads on the team to the stakeholders who were, who were informing our work, we made sure we had people from across all those UX disciplines who were in a position to give feedback and really inform the direction of the project. And finally, um, we just expected everybody to get shit done. So you really build a stronger team culture when you focus less on sort of your level, whether you're a manager, whether you're a lead, whether you're an individual contributor, and everybody just kind of rolls up their sleeves and does the work. Um, and that was our expectation. So I was the champion of this project, and I was one of the leads on the team. Um, and at one point in time, I think I had a 180-page Google document that I was working with, um, and you know, was writing and editing and uh, commenting on wireframes, and, and everybody across every role on the team did that. And the way that I think this multidisciplinarity really comes together, this holistic way of approaching UX in our design system, is in how we present our components. So again, just a refresher for those of you who uh, don't are familiar with that word. A component is, it's basically a building block of an interface. So the example I'm gonna walk through with you is a button. So if you, if you use the internet, you know what a button is. Um, so I'm gonna go over the next few slides and just sort of talk through what we include in each component page. And um, the, every single page is the same because we designed a template that defined what the core things we wanted to include for each component would be. And then we really expected everybody to contribute to the content. So every single component page starts with a purpose. Um, we thought it was really important for anybody who were gonna be using our components as building blocks to understand the purpose that a thing serves on a website. Or, sorry, not on a website, but on Shopify. Um, and then we go into all the examples. So these are all the different places that this, in this case, a button might show within Shopify. So you might have a red button that's for a destructive action as an example. And then all of those show in a drop-down menu. And then when you choose a different example, then it will sort of update to explain when you might use that example. So um, we want to give people access to a destructive button, but we certainly don't want to have destructive red buttons all over our site. So it was really important for people to understand how to use these different variations of components. And then there's a visual example. And then you get a little bit further into the section that is more geared towards uh, developers. And there's a section which is a code snippet that could be copied in React in HTML or, or HTML. And then beneath that, there's sort of a list of parameters. And this is an interactive playground. And you can actually change most of these things and then see the image above update and also have the code update so that you can really play with the limits of each component. Then a little further down, we go into the user context where we really explain the merchant problem and the merchant solution that each component is solving. UX best practices. You have to remember that uh, third-party developers also use this as a resource, and a lot of them actually don't have access to anybody who works in UX. So you might have just a developer who's building great apps and, and doesn't really have anybody to work with on the user experience side of things. So we wanted to make sure that user experience guidelines were available. And then finally, you go into my favorite part of the page, um, the content guidelines. It, it's not important, it's, it's, if somebody can design a button, that's one thing. If they know the right kind of button to use, that's one thing. But I think the way that we communicate what is gonna happen with the interaction, the words we use in interfaces, it really matters. So for each component that had a content element, we wanted to make sure to really define um, the best way to write content for that element. And so the reason that we took the time to add all of this context for every component um, is because that's how we approach UX at Shopify. We really take a holistic approach, and the reason that we do that is because we believe that it provides the best experience for our merchants, and so it was really important for us to reflect that and how we presented and assembled the building blocks for Shopify. 
Okay, so um, this is the last under the water section, and then we're gonna get to the iceberg bit. Are you all excited? Yeah? <laughs> all right. Okay, so um, inventory, tangible and intangible elements. So I mentioned earlier that a design system in some ways is like the water around you. If you're building product, it's there, whether you acknowledge it, whether you're intentional about it or not. Um, but to make that visible, what we wanted to do was really have a look at the things, the components, the internal components, I guess, that made up our design system. So before I go into a design system example, I'll use a comparison that some of you may be familiar with, which is the TTC. Um, this is the transportation system in Toronto, for those of you who don't know. Um, so every single system is made up of tangible and intangible elements. So in the case of the TTC, it might be things like trains, tracks, maps, drivers, the stations or stops. So these are all the things that are they're not abstract. They're easy to see, they're easy to understand. You know, you can probably touch them. And then there are a bunch of intangible elements that sort of join together these tangible elements. So these are things like the feelings. In the case of the TTC, it's probably frustration. Um, <laughs> the feelings that people have. Um, safety and how they think about safety and how the TTC thinks about safety and how they communicate that to all the people who work for them. Um, their maintenance and planning schedules and even their brand. I mean, certainly they have a logo and that's more of a tangible element, but a brand is more than a logo. Um, and then underpinning all of these tangible and intangible elements is generally the purpose of the system. So in the case of the TTC, their stated purpose is reliable, efficient, integrated transportation system. In the case of a design system, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, it's just meant to give you some examples. Um, at Shopify, we have the humans that make up our UX team. Um, we had the components that were in our interface that we could sort of point to and look at. Um, we had a set of visual standards, we had a set of content standards. These already existed uh, in our internal vault, although we needed to update them. We have research, we have access to data, and then we have a UI kit that's available in Sketch. So these are some examples of some of the tangible parts of our system. And then we have the less tangible parts of our system, the parts that are harder to really understand and, and kind of hold. Um, so these are things like principles. We have some stated design principles, but principles are fairly abstract. Um, you, if you've worked in design, um, you sometimes hear people say, well, it's not high quality enough. But when you ask somebody to define what they mean, it can be really hard. It's kind of like, oh, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. Um, the processes that we had, the communication uh, between teams, the, the rationales that we used when we would speak about our work, and other things, many other things. And so all of these things need to pin together to uh, support our purpose. Uh, which is quality, efficiency, and alignment. So it can be really hard to know where to start when you are trying to identify these tangible and intangible elements. Um, and so some of the things that, that we did was just start by asking questions. So how do people already know what to do? That can point you in the direction of different processes that may exist, different documentation that may exist. What are the common assumptions? Like what do people believe about their work and how they're approaching their work? What resources and documentation already exists? Um, there are a lot of a lot of companies that I know that uh, maintain their content standards just in a shared document. How do people know when they're aligned? So how do people know when they have agreement on things? And how are different teams collaborating? So the value of this exercise of looking at the tangible and intangible elements of your system is that it starts to shake out things that are wonky and lets you address them. So when we did this exercise, we noted that within our vault, we had a whole bunch of different documentation about content standards. We had a set of content standards that were maintained by our product content strategy team. We had some content standards that were created by our help team. Um, and we had a whole bunch of other stuff that was out of date. Um, and so when we realized this, we were able to compare them and we were able to sort of go, okay, which of these pieces is the most relevant? Which of these pieces is an agreement? Which of these pieces uh, is not an agreement and we have to have some conversations? Um, and which of these pieces really want, we want to elevate and we want to document in a, in a more formal way? And so this ended up being a pretty deep collaboration between the content strategists on the project and the people who work on our help center. And um, we ended up with this fairly robust section about content 
that covers everything from product content rules to help center to voice and tone, all the way down to how to write great alternative text so that people who are using a screen reader can properly navigate through your site. And this last section that I want to talk about is um, the part that is the thing that gets the most attention, which is the style guide portion, the thing that we, that we launch publicly. Um, and in the process of sort of building that map, building that map of our system. So there was a lot of writing involved in this portion of the work, and we really took a content first approach. And the reason that we did that wasn't for some strange um, prioritization of content strategy reason, but it was really because when you write about things, it helps you to think about things, and it helps you to understand where the gaps are in your thinking. Um, and so this wasn't an exercise that we just had writers or content strategists do. Our goal in the first draft was not to get really excellent prose. Our goal was to get people to really think through our different components as a way of understanding where they made sense and, and where actually we had trouble rationalizing their existence, to be honest. So for a banner component, and a banner is basically a block that sits at the top of our interfaces, um, and it's a pretty, can be a very useful, but also can be pretty disruptive to merchants, because when they go to a section of Shopify, it's the first thing that they see. Um, so what we, and we had a lot of different kinds of banners on our, on Shopify. So when we started kind of looking, we noticed there were so many different variations of it. And in some cases, we're, we were able to explain why, and in some cases, we were not. Like, there was no real good reason for certain variations to exist. So in the process of writing about the purpose of every single component, it really helped us to sort of poke holes in, in their utility and their usefulness, and helped us to think about what they were doing within our system. And it also helped us to identify common patterns that we wanted to document, and also things that we wanted to get rid of. Um, so some examples are call to action. You know, as a UX person, you really need to be able to understand and explain why you might choose to put a call to action in body text or why you might put it on a button in the footer. These are really small details, but they matter a lot. And so doing this exercise was one way of thinking through all of those different variations and understanding where they made sense, where they didn't make sense, and also to define a really clear rationale for the decisions we were making. Another thing is dismissible. Should you be able to get rid of a banner? In some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. But what are those cases? And can we explain that to people clearly? Um, and then color, icon, tone of voice types of things. So um, we have one banner, which is the red banner here, and it's a banner that we don't want to use very often. And in fact, in the guidelines, we say, don't use this very often because it's really stressful if you're a merchant and you're trying to run your business and you get this red banner because it's kind of a notification that something's gone wrong. Um, so really thinking about color and how we would explain color with intention, icon, um, and how we would shift the, the tone of the content to really match the situation and respond to the merchant's emotions. And this is just, I actually just covered this, so this is some, example, uh, some examples of where we would explain um, the different types of banners and the color choices that we used and the merchant impact. So importantly, when we, when we started to pull together this documentation, we didn't just document what existed. You know, if there were 50 different banner variations on Shopify, we didn't just document 50 different banner variations. We really thought through what, what was the utility of each variation and and really put it upon ourselves to be able to really rationalize our decisions as a way of deciding what would go into the style guide and what would not. And the other thing we did was we really defaulted to open. And this is, this is a real Shopify characteristic. Um, this is something that we believe and we talk about a lot internally. And some of the ways that we did that on this project was we defaulted to tools that really lowered the bar for contribution. So I mentioned earlier that I was managing a 180 page Google document. Um, the reason I used a Google document was simply because it's pretty easy to use. Um, at one point in time, we opened up editing permissions and we shared it with everybody in the entire company and encouraged them to comment and add their perspective and their feedback. Um, and it was a little bit noisy, but the noise was absolutely worth it because we learned a whole bunch of things and I think most importantly, it was one of the ways that people felt a shared sense of ownership in this work. Um, we also wrote, then took all the content and wrote it in uh, Markdown and GitHub. 
And we did this because we, again, really wanted people to even be able to push changes to our content once the site was live. Um, yeah. So just to recap. So whether or not you have a beautiful style guide that you can show people, your design system already exists. If you're building products, um, if you're working with um, in a user experience profession, there are ways that you're making decisions. Um, your design system may be dysfunctional, but it's already there. So one of the things that you can really do is, is look at how you're doing your work, how your team is doing your work, and start to try to make it visible and uh, start to think about it more intentionally. Because a style guide really, at the end of the day, is just a map. It's just a map of how you work. Um, it should help you work better, it should help build alignment, but it is not the deep work that happens beneath the surface that really um, helps with all of those complex problems that I talked about earlier. And our approach uh, was to understand the problem, assemble and empower a really great multidisciplinary team, do an inventory of our tangible and intangible elements so that we could really start to see the water around us. And finally, we built the map with lots and lots of help. And today, it's still a work in progress. Uh, this work will never be done. We have a design system team that is actively <laughs> iterating and working on it. And um, it'll continue to change as our needs change and as our design system evolves. So that's all I've got for you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that was fantastic. So uh, you're going to have a couple minutes to like go to the washroom, grab a new drink, uh, while Brad gets ready for his piece. So sit tight. Uh, hi, my name's Brad. Uh, I am pretty new to Shopify Plus. Uh, I just joined about three months ago. Uh, but I, in this talk, I'll talk about uh, what I did in a previous life. Um, that's very applicable to Polaris and what we're doing today. Um, and I'm going to take you through a case study of doing a multi-brand design system um, and how it's implemented and used in, in uh, you know, a marketing platform or an e-commerce platform. Uh, so I'm currently the UX lead of uh, the merchant globalization practice at Shopify. Um, I spent the better part of my career working with large multinationals, uh, mostly building uh, marketing platforms and e-commerce systems, and um, I've created and managed multiple design systems for various clients. Um, I am an ex-developer, um, so you know, what's made me successful in my career is taking an engineering approach to design, um, and that's very much what you'll see in this, uh, in this talk here. Uh, so these are some of my past clients. Um, I've worked uh, with you know, FCA, with Jeep, Ram, Dodge, Chrysler, Fiat, the other one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I worked with Levi's, uh, Nike, Lilo Lemon, uh, BRP, Shaw, um, you know, New Era, these are all really big brands uh, that um, really care about their design, their website, care about design, their, you know, the, the system that they're using. Um, so throughout my career in dealing with these you know, large, difficult clients, um, I've developed a strategy for how to kind of build design systems in a, in a very um, repeatable way for each of these uh, different clients. So uh, what's the common theme for these types of brands? Um, they're really big companies, obviously. Um, and for these companies, efficiency is key. Um, you know, these are a lot of, these are companies that have kind of hit market saturation for the most point, part, and um, their revenue is mostly kind of a flat line. The way that they increase their profits is by lowering their operating expenses. Um, so ultimately, um, what you know, what, when those types of companies would come to an agency that I worked at, they would often be trying to improve their efficiency. Um, so what we would do as a designer is, is work on how to uh, really make uh, going live with pages and, and going live with um, you know new sites that they might spin up a lot faster and more efficient. Um, brand identity is also very important for these brands. Um, obviously, um, you know Nike is one that has a particular brand, and they don't want anyone to mess with it. Um, and when you own a design system for a company. Um, and other people start to use it, you want to maintain brand standards across that, right? Um, if you have, you know, hundreds of designers working on your brand, you want them to have a, you know, something to hold on to when they're, when they're um, designing for them. 
Um, and in these kind of marketing and e-commerce type uh, platforms, um, they're managed by non-technical users. So you're not going to have a developer every time you would need to make a content update to uh, a marketing site. Um, especially when you're dealing with agency because that becomes a very expensive process. So um, you want to make these accessible to non-technical users. And they should last a very long time. Um, you don't want to blow up your website every two years and spend $10 million redoing it um, and do that every over and over again because then um, what's the point? So what do you do about this? You make it sound like system. Um, uh, Amy went through a, a lot of what they are. And, um, I'm gonna, I'm taking a bit of a different spin on it because it, uh, it's you know, how they're used and how they're related to marketing platforms. Um, but I'll, you'll see a lot of kind of similar themes, especially in relation to um, you know what it does organizationally. Um, so yeah, they're a collection of reusable components and standards. And we all understand what that is now. Um, they're usually centrally governed. Uh, they'll be used by a lot of other uh, types of. Um, designers, like you know, I'm on the virtual mobilization team, I use Polaris, uh, but I'm not this, like on the design team that is that essentially governing that, uh, that design system. Uh, it's always evolving, and good ones do, uh, and they're crazy useful. Um, so typically what they get you is a consistent user experience. Um, the story I go to a lot is, uh, you know, uh, Ram Trucks is a, a subsidiary brand of SCA. Um, and when we did an audit of their initial experience before designing the design system, they had um, 37 different button types. Um, and as a user, and, you know, if you need to click on you know, actions to take on the site, um, if you have to remember 37 different ways of doing it, it doesn't, you know, it's not a great experience. Um, so we got that down to three button types, so that it's really consistent that users know what a button is. And then whenever you create a UI for RAM, uh, you now, it looks the same as everything else. Um, it gives you the ability to create content efficiently, um, and I guess that actually goes well with the next point, which allows you to iterate quickly. Um, you know, you can just slam together a bunch of components and make a UI, rather than having to you know, like focus on the details every single time you're doing it, because those details are well thought through, and uh, they're there for you to just use. So, you know, using Polaris, we can very easily spin up a whole bunch of new UIs to test out, because we're not redesigning every single detail of every UI over and over again. Um, and it's a really solid foundation for development. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of an architecture for how to make a design system. And what that does is it separates things out in, into layers that actually make it a pretty um, maintainable uh, system. And uh, obviously this allows you to do it at scale, which is uh, the most important thing for, for these uh, types of systems. So here's the anatomy of a design system. Um, this is something that I came up with, but you'll probably see a lot of um, takes on this in a lot of different ways, because it's, um, it's not rocket science. Um, but ultimately, in the first layer, you have the design layer. Um, and I'll talk about each layer in turn as we go through this uh, talk. Um, next, we have what you call the functional UI layer. That's what I call it. Uh, we have a data transfer layer. Uh, we have a content design layer that accesses the content model. Um, and then all that kind of comes together to make it um, and the first three steps are kind of the bare minimum to make what's called an isomorphic UI framework. Um, Polaris is an isomorphic UI framework. Um, and it's basically, you know, you could take that UI and put it on any other back end and it would still work the same way. Um, you just, you know, rehook up the data transfer layer and you're set. So that's, uh, you know, where the word isomorphic comes from. Um, but I'm also going to get into some of the uses of uh, the rest of the layers, because um, that's where you really unlock the power of the design system. Um, so for the design layer, you know, if you take uh, Jeep, for instance, they have a brand. Uh, they have this logo, they have this brand font. Uh, so, you know, we might have a body font and a primary and secondary color. And their secondary color is black, which is a bitch to work with. And, and, uh, we're trying to uh, draw attention to it, but we won't go there. Um, and, and this is what really describes the brand, the brand design that they come up with this. Um, and they might have a bunch of icons that they use as well. Um, and then the next step you want to do in the design layer is a semantic brand mapping. Um, so basically, if you're doing a multi-brand design system, 
uh, you might say, okay, Jeep has this, this RAM color here, uh, but then you know, Fiat has this color here, RAM has this color here, and those all kind of map to the concept of a primary brand color. Um, so this is where you map those various attributes of a brand to uh, some kind of semantics. Uh, and uh, Dave McVitie, who's gonna talk next, uh, is gonna talk about uh, you know, a way to, like, in, very, in a lot of detail, get into how you actually implement the design of your design system. Um, you might have fonts, uh, different fonts for different brands. Um, so here we have you know, Chrysler, Dodge, and Jeep on here. And um, you know, our goal here was to really normalize the amount of space that each of these uh, fonts would take up. So you can see here we have uh, Novocento, which is 60 pixels for brand heading one, uh, but then Dodge would be like 68 pixels for brand heading one. So the idea was um, as much as possible to normalize uh, the width that each of these would take up so that when you deal with kind of a responsive UI, you don't have breaking in really weird areas. And obviously it's not perfect, but uh, you know these fonts are very, very different. And you want to limit these to a certain set of, uh, of headings. You don't want to allow every single size under the sun because then you have a lot of inconsistency, inconsistency in how that hierarchy is expressed in the UI. So here's how you might use a, um, the semantics of a, a, a UI component. Um, you, know, you have this, this color here um, on this, this tab, and then you have like a button. And uh, those are both using the primary brand color. So if you were to take that exact same component, move it over to Fiat, it would use their purple over to the Jeep, and it would use their yellow. So the idea here is that's how you separate those concerns out. Um, the functional UI layer is basically like a bunch of Lego blocks. So if you like Lego, you'll like the built-in functional UI layer. Um, that's you know really where all of the functionality of a component um, is, all the user-facing functionality of a component comes into play. So um, you know, let's say you have this component here that we call a feature explorer. Um, it's this thing where you can click on these tabs at the top and that might change the panel underneath. Um, that might be the kind of content level component that a content author would have control over. That gets uh, broken up into its various atomic parts. So you have uh, what we'll call an image description component. There's three of those in this feature explorer. Uh, that image description component has a description block that goes inside of that spot and then that's actually using a button. Um, it's using a lot more components, but the idea is that all these components work together to make the whole. Uh, and you know, this allows maintainability to, um, to work really well, because if you go in and you know, change uh, the way that a button behaves, then that uh, uh, propagates itself to every single instance of it, which has its own problems, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and the thing with components is that, really weird noise. Um, the thing with components is that they don't know about any, you know, they're, they're brothers and sisters. Um, a component is something that stands on its own, so you need some way for them to communicate with each other. Um, so what they might do here, uh, you know, when I was working on the system, we called them input-output stores, but there, um, you know, might be like a state variable in React or something like that. Um, when you, you know, let's say this user clicks on this tab, it might emit what, uh, what, you know, this current engine equals one, and then this component would listen to that and put up a store and then react accordingly. Um, so the idea here is to um, support uh, communication between components with uh, these kind of indirect variables. And this is really useful. Um, you know, if you build the functionality of like setting a tab, and it actually relies on a click rather than on like a variable being, being changed. That makes things like um, putting a variable in the URL to pre-select that tab, it makes it difficult you now tie the action of the tab to a click rather than to something that is uh, an external to that. Uh, next is the data transfer layer. Um, so this button, it can be described uh, when, it's, you know, when, it's, when it's interacting with the functional UI layer and the design layer. Um, it can really be described with just text. Um, and that's what you know, you'll get back from a web service we call uh, the back end. So you'll just get like, some JSON or some uh, XML back. Um, so you can describe each of these components with a set of attributes. And uh, what you saw in the Polaris style guide was, was you know, that HTML snippet was, was ultimately what the text that described the component. Um, so here you have know, this button, it has a destination URL, an action, um, could be things like new tab, uh, open a modal, uh, open the link in the same window. You want to give kind of the designer control over those things in this button. 
uh, like a label, an icon, and a style. Um, so if you, you know, were to tweak each of those individual um, elements, that would, you know, the functional UI layer would, would decide how that would behave. And then that can be nested. So you might have this button, which is, you know, that's, that describes the button, but it might sit inside a larger component where you now have this descriptive block, which has a title, and it has content that has a paragraph and key stats and all, you know, all these things that kind of uh, stack up to, to describe the component. Um, next up is the content model. This one is the hardest one to do right. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into, into details of how it's used uh, shortly, but um, a vehicle feature is something that is like common to every single car. It's going to have a bunch of vehicle features. Um, and it might have uh, metadata, like what vehicle year it's related to. It might be a set of vehicle years that it's related to. Um, it might have a, a sales code related to that feature. Um, it might have a description. Um, it'll have marketing metadata, like things that are uh, accessible from the, uh, from the website. It might actually have things that are just engineering metadata that might somehow come into play. Um, so when you're modeling content, you want to kind of describe all the different uses of, um, of you know, a particular concept that you're trying to communicate and separate it into, into um, different parts of the model that, uh, that makes sense. So in this case, uh, you know, with, with FCA, um, the vehicle feature, you know, a lot of stuff was accessible through web services, and then other things were in the CMS, like, you know, some admin metadata. You know, if you got um, approval for a particular description during a certain time that you need to kind of, like, legally keep track of, that was all part of that vehicle feature uh, content model. Um, you have marketing metadata and vehicle metadata here as well. Next is the content design layer. Um, so this is basically where all the magic happens in the marketing platform. Um, this is where um, a CMS uh, you know, maintainer or a brand designer can go in and actually build pages. Um, so let's say they want to you know, build a home page for Fiat here. They have a template. Um, and they want to add like a hero component to, to the page. So that is, this is uh, Adobe CQ. Uh, they would just you know, drag this component in here. And uh, you know, they, and they start to create that page. So let's say they wanted to make this hero right here. So um, you've got this this image. You've got some text here, and then it's, you know, this is four slides and then a hero. So you're just uh, a typical carousel. So this hero is made up of four different panels, and each of those panels will have some content associated to it. The way it looks in a, in a typical CMS is you'll have a bunch of fields that you go in and fill out. Um, so here we've got this hero component. You're now putting in all the data for that hero component. Um, so you might say, uh, you know, what brand it is to make sure that you have the proper uh, coloring and stuff on the actual button. Um, and you might have some, uh, you know, a carousel theme, for instance, to decide what um, what those, uh, you know, the, we call them meatballs, but the things that show the different panels. Uh, what color those should appear as. Um, yeah, everything was named after food. You know, hamburger menu, meatballs, um, hot dogs are like little tap uh, indicators. It's a common thing. Um, and, and you might have other things here, like hide on tablet and mobile. So you might have things to say, okay, this particular component we only want to show in desktop. Um, so we want to click that and it'll tell the function of the UI layer to go and do that. Um, and in a good CMS, and this is really rare, um, all of these things can also access the content model. Um, a lot of times these are just like dumb fields that you write in, but when they access a content model, that's when you can like truly harness the power of, of like a, um, an, a you know, managed information system. Um, because especially if your content model is global, you can now create one instance of a component that can now have every single translation associated to it. Um, so having this linked up to a content model is, is huge for uh, maintainability. Um, so let's say you're making this panel here. You have this this guy you know, sitting in the top left with two buttons. Um, you know, then you, when you're actually setting up a panel, you might have other attributes that decide how it should behave. So you might have up here it says content alignment, um, and there's nine different selections you can make that decide where that content goes. So depending on the imagery that uh, the brand is using, they can choose to put that content uh, wherever it needs to go so that it doesn't overlap with you know, the subject in the image. Um, and the idea is to build expressiveness and flexibility in the design system so that you don't kind of like tie the hands of, of the, 
brand designers that are trying to use it. And so, so an example of one of those things is like uh, this, this, you know, this attribute called apply content box background. And there's headline, body, body only, and none. And what that effectively does is, you know, none will have no background, body only will put a background under this part, and then headline and body will put a, a background around this part. Um, and that allows you to uh, provide some flexibility to the brand designer to say, hey, you know, if you if you have this really kind of messy image that that um, will interfere with the text, you probably want to use the headline and body um, option. Whereas, uh, you know, if your if your image is pretty clean, unless you say you're showing like a field with a bunch of snow on it, um, then you can use the none option, to make that text legible. Um, and then this is kind of the, uh, a view into the data transfer layer where you know the content author goes in and they put all those those uh, those attributes into a component. It gets kind of divided up and expressed to the uh, to the functional UI layer using this kind of data, right? So this is just translating all that all that attribute data into uh, JSON, and it's saying you know the place speed is zero, the height is short. You might have different um, heights of, of carousels that you want to support. Um, and so all of this is passing uh, data into the function Weiler that then decides how that's going to um, you know, uh, present itself. So to build a page, uh, that just becomes as simple as like dropping some components on a page, setting some attributes, and you're done. So here, you know, you might add this. You might add a, a vehicle lineup. You might add some uh, a promo tile area underneath. And now the the um, the task of creating a page is just you know, assembling these components, and you don't have to worry about the details of every single interaction. Um, so that's kind of the basics of how you put together a design system. Um, it gets fun and complicated once you get into uh, globalization. Um, so a design system will actually really help you go global. Um, there's a couple ways that you can do it, and it really depends on uh, what, uh, what your needs as a business are. So, you know, ideally, uh, you would just do the content model. So let's say you have a vehicle feature, um, and there's a vehicle metadata associated to it. You might have a sales code, vehicle ID, vehicle year. All those things are pretty consistent across different um, locales, right? The, the year doesn't change if you're in Japan versus if you're in the US. Uh, but the description might change. So you might have a master description, which is kind of like default. Um, and then you might have these overrides in different areas of the world where, you know, in France you have the French description, in Japan you have the Japanese description, uh, in Germany you have the German description. And if you're you know, using this gold standard content model and referring to that in the CMS, um, you know, you could just do one instance of that component and then uh, it would just present the right language to the user. Um, not every company can do that. Um, some companies might have really different needs in different markets. So you may not be able to have kind of the same content for every single uh, piece of the website for every market. Um, so the way you might handle that, if you, you know, take a look at this uh, architecture, is you might have different instances of that content design layer. So let's say um, Japan had only two vehicles and they uh, you know, only have a, a couple pages that they want to that they want to present to their users versus the you know huge amount of pages that a U.S. site would want to do. Um, then you can just have different uh, instances of this content design layer so that um, they're using the same design system, but they just have uh, different instances of the pages. Um, and then the hardest part of a design system is around governance. Um, Honestly, you know, it took us eight months to make that design system and about uh, a year and a half to govern it and, and make everybody okay with the process of, of governing it, um, especially when you're dealing with a really big company. Um, this is by far the hardest part of a design system. Um, so, but if you do it right, then um, it can be somewhat healthy. Um, so you have this, this, these layers and all the separation, all the concerns are separated, which is great. Uh, because then you can have like the brand design team that owns the brand design layer. Um, you can have a you know the des systems design team might own that isomorphic UI framework. Um, you might have the content strategy team owning the content model and keeping that updated. Um, and then you might have a series of uh, kind of brand designers and um, and you know brand content strategists 
that are working together to actually design the content for the site. And the, the nature of the, the content strategists in each of these is a little bit different. Um, the, the content strategists that this kind of work are more kind of like library science focused, like they do modeling, IA, um, that kind of thing. Um, and, and this kind of uh, content strategy is more around like um, what we're going to say on the page and how we're going to say it. So, um, you know, the, these, the, the nature of the work is very different, but um, as content strategists do, they tend to wear many, many hats. So, uh, they're very useful in, in many ways. Um, so yeah, so here, uh, especially in a multi-brand system, you might have multiple teams. You might have you know, the RAM team, the Jeep team, the Chrysler team. They're all maintaining their websites, and they might be using the, the same design system uh, that's managed by this design systems team. Um, and the way that um, we set up the governance structure was um, somewhat formal, and it kind of has to be formal, because especially if you're dealing with you know, 100 people, you're not always going to all agree on what the design system should be, so you need a bit of a process. Um, so the way that it worked with us was, a, um, you know, the, the brand would have to talk to, um, sorry, the brand designers would work with the brand. So let's say Jeep has a campaign coming up, they need to make a site, um, and they need to come up with a concept for how they're going to meet those business needs. So they would do some design concepting, work with clients to get that in a good spot, and then once everything's uh, hunky-dory, um, then they might bring in the design systems team to do like a component audit of their uh, of their design. Say, okay, this is this is an existing component. Um, this needs to be redesigned so that you can use this component. Um, this is something entirely new, so we might need to make a new component of that. Um, so we basically like mark up the whole design and decide, you know, what can be done with the existing components, what can be done with a small update, and then what can be done, um, what needs an entirely new build of it. Um, so the existing components are really easy. You just do it. Um, the new and updated components need to uh, now be actually built. Um, so the, the structure we have is similar to what Spotify has actually, is uh, what we call the, uh, the design guild. Um, and it's basically a representative from each of the teams who would get together and look at the, comp uh, the proposal and say, okay, that component, um, that makes sense to be included in the design system. Um, I have all these other use cases that I could see for that, so they might build that into the way that that component should work. So I say, okay, make sure this component can, can meet all these other needs. Um, so that would go into uh, kind of this design guild meeting, um, and then you'd go and actually build the component. So uh, you know, the design systems team would then take on the component design, um, and, the content, and, and the content strategy team would then take on the content model be a lot of back and forth to make sure that that um, you know, component was properly used in the content model. You then make the component, uh, and then you then release it to the uh, to the brand design team to now use that component to make their story happen. Uh, and the benefit of that is because you've built it as a component that's accessible to multiple brands, if another brand like Chrysler wants to go and do the exact same thing, they can just reuse the component and know, in a matter of seconds, rather than um, having to do a whole new build with a whole bunch of people to redo the exact same thing. Um, the part where things get a bit nasty with this, um, if you want to do like a, um, a continuous integration type of thing where like, uh, you know, like the, the latest version of the design system is always pushed live to every single uh, brand, you're going to run into a ton of regressions. So you know you might you might push a, an update to the carousel panel that works for this instance on Jeep, but then it really messes up another instance for Chrysler. So you want to be very careful how you version this design system. Um, so the way that this typically goes is you know your design system might release for the 1.0. You might make some updates, add some new components to it, um, get to a version 1.2, and then the app goes live using version 1.2 of this design system. So they're using kind of a a version that's frozen in time at this point. The design system will go along and let's say they um, make an update in 1.3 where they add like this optional field to a component. Um, that really doesn't matter to this application, so it's not the used version 1.3, but let's say you add another optional version of a, uh, sorry, an optional field to a component that they really want to use, then they might actually upgrade to version 1.4. And if all goes well, it's a really simple merge and you just go live with it. Um, 
this learning system will continue on, and let's say they get to a big, you know, version 2.0 where they change like the nature of a lot of the components. Now, some of these components have completely different data models. Um, well, in that case, if you want to upgrade to uh, to this version of the design system, you now need to do a migration where you take your, you know, every instance of that component and update all of the uh, all of the data models. Um, so that's a, a much more onerous kind of process. Um, this is why you don't want to do a continuous integration model with this, is because um, you're going to cause a lot of regressions, and, and it really um, it makes it difficult for you to make updates to the design system because then um, you know you might not want to make those updates because you're going to cause regressions on people, and you might be stuck with kind of a term that you don't want to use rather than using the best the best possible uh, version of the component. So this this kind of gets around that by, by doing some versioning and, and then it become a man, it becomes a managed process to upgrade. So um, in conclusion, you know, a design system is made by separating the concerns between different layers of abstraction, and I'm sure that can be just you know separated out further and further. Um, you know, dividing ownership by primary team function. You know, you want the brand designers to care about how to tell the brand story. You don't want to have you know have to have them worry about every nitty gritty detail. Of a UI when, when they're when they're doing something, um, implementing governance that answers the business needs. So you know a design a design system team by itself doesn't really do anything, and you don't want them to just go and make components because then they're not doing it in the context of a business need, and they may get way off base and develop something that isn't useful. Um, so you really want the uh, the needs of the business to drive uh, what types of components. And uh, it's really useful to formalize a versioning deployment strategy because otherwise you can run into a, a big headache mess. Uh, so, in conclusion, that's the model. And, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so, we'll have another small couple minute break. Uh, if you need to go to the washroom, chat with friends. Uh, and then Dave is going to come up to wrap up the evening to talk about design tokens, uh, which is going to be really awesome. And after he wraps up his Right in. Uh, Dave is going to talk to us about uh, design tokens. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm front of the developer here at Chocolate. Uh, I've been here for about nine-ish months now. Uh, feels like it's been both forever and like a week. Uh, so yeah, I'll dive right in. So my talk today is going to be on how we go from design decisions to code um, and how we actually get those decisions into our the design system and actually make that available to developers to use downstream. Uh, so at some point, design intention needs to be mapped to a usable system value that are available for developers when crafting and styling components for a design system. To get started, let's think about the actual values that we eventually want to have power in our design system. These include things like color, hexes, spacing values, font families, animation, easing and timing, and icons. Uh, the example on the slide here come from our Polaris design library. Um, these can be referred to generally as visual design attributes and represent the most primitive data types that power the design system's look and feel. So every design system has some manner to set design, have visual design attributes so they can be used by developers to create the building blocks of the design system. This is typically done by mapping primitive values to human readable variables. A common pattern for web-focused design systems is to embed design variables in style sheets as SCSS or SAS variables. Uh, well, this accomplish the goal of making design attributes available in code with meaningful variable names, making changes can be tedious. Uh, in our example on this slide, we have a shared color for two types of links. If we wanted to change our link color, we must change this in multiple places. So this is fine for two instances we have here, but imagine we have a larger file. When a decision is made to change the color, spacing, font, or other attribute, each instance must be investigated to ensure that changing it has the desired effect. A simple find and replace on a hex value may result in unwanted effects. In a large system, there may be dozens or hundreds of uses, and each one requires a review, and that's not a scalable process. So how do we solve this? In design systems often use abstractions to set design variables, or design actors as variables that can be used over and over again. In our example up here, we're setting a link color variable um, in a general SCSS file, and then we use it to map to our uh, two instances down there. So when we make a change to that link color variable the hex, it'll actually reflect down into our downstream file. In Polaris, we do something a little bit different. Uh, visual design attributes are stored in SCSS data structures rather than individual variables. Uh, this example up here is our Polaris color palette, 
which has several dark and light variants for each color family. Uh, the SCSX mix-in function is used to return the design attribute value based on human readable names. So our example again here has uh, a link color that's blue, and we're setting a background color that's a lighter green. Uh, this can be used to set SCSS variables like in the example of the previous slide, or set CSS properties directly like background color is in this example. So when this is compiled to CSS, the value derived from the data structure through the mix-in is set in the value for the DOM and the CSS, the CSS value in the DOM, and is picked up by elements on the page. Uh, we can access this pattern, but it's not the only way to accomplish this. So who here has forked or worked with a bootstrap library before from source? These number of folks, excellent. Uh, so if you ever customize bootstrap themes from source, we familiar with the variables on the SCSS file. That's kind of your god file for how variables are defined and how colors and fonts and everything is defined in a bootstrap uh, theme. Atomic variables like colors are used everywhere throughout the file and to find even more variables downstream that have meaningful names to be consumed by components. So in our example here, we have link color that picks up the primary variable, which matches to the blue variable, which is actually the hex we want. So when we actually get them compiling this into code, we have our link code here that represents the variable, which eventually ends up as the hex value. And that's what will actually be set on the anchor tag when it hits the DOM. So this is great, but storing that aspects in CSS files only really works for web-focused uh, frameworks like Polaris and Bootstrap, which are driven entirely by style sheets. We run into scalability issues when we started looking at expanding beyond a CSS-driven web framework. For the mature design system, we may have libraries available for several web technologies, mobile platforms, and associated documentation and style guides. This creates a bottleneck where design decisions around global color, spacing, and other elements require developers to be rolled out. With the vast disparity in how design metrics can be used on different platforms, this may require several developers with different specializations to make the changes to support multiple platforms. So how can we apply, des apply design decisions quickly and consistently across many platforms? That is where design tokens comes in. Design tokens are a pattern for divide, design, <laughs> defining visual attributes, uh, visual design attributes, so they can be used across multiple platforms and use cases. This is a term that has been popularized by the sales by Salesforce and is a concept integrated into the Lightning design system. Uh, this is sort of new territory for us and something that we've only begun investigating, integrating into our Polaris library. So design tokens are a layer between design decisions and the design system's code. Tokens exist in a general format, either YAML or JSON, and are then transformed and formatted for consumption on any platform. Following this pattern, design decisions only need to be reflected in the token library, and changes will be reflected in all your supported platforms. This approach lets us place design attributes in a consistent location, rather than being buried deep in, deep, deep in the code for each of our supported platforms. So I'm interested in something called Theo. Uh, Salesforce developed this public library called Theo to transform and format design tokens. Uh, they built it to support their Lightning design system, but the project is open source and available to anyone on GitHub. So here's a quick example of some of the Polaris variables transformed into tip design tokens. Um, this is a YAML file. Uh, we have colors, we have spacing, and we have some typography up there. So there's a couple of quick examples. We won't go into them too deep, uh, but they'll be available in the slide deck afterwards if you want to take a deeper look at this. Um, in its purest form, design tokens are the sort of visual design attributes we looked at earlier, colors, spacing, fonts, etc. Following this approach, tokens become visual design atoms in the system. In a more advanced implementation, they can be used to set aliases or altered as part of a transform and processing. So Theo provides a variety of different output formats used across many platforms. This includes SCSS, SAS, LESS, CSS module, a couple of JavaScript formats, Android and iOS, or just plain old JSON. Uh, Theo also allows you to write custom output formats, which can be used to make design tokens map to any language you want. So here's an example of uh, a compiled version of our uh, Polaris design tokens and how it might be used in a supporting style sheet downstream. Uh, so it's compiled, the left side is the compiled side, and the right side is where we're including it to actually use some component style. And that's kind of high level global resets more or less, but the example holds. Uh, again, the same design token can be compiled to a JavaScript module format and be including our React files to be used in inline style. 
So using this approach, if you want to change our base blue color, and simply changing the design token will result in that change being made to all instances that use it across all platforms. This is similar to the CSS example we looked at earlier, except that by changing the design token, we're changing the value on all platforms, not just our style sheets. So this is probably the aspect of design tokens that excites me the most. Uh, by following this pattern, designers can become the curators of design tokens. Uh, as a developer, whether it's grade, or grade 20 is hash AAA or EEE, it doesn't really make much of a difference to me. Uh, and whether the modal background should use grade 100 or grade 50 is now would happily change for a designer without hesitation. Uh, but developer energy is required to make this work. Uh, instead, designers, instead of designers communicating with developers to tell them what design attributes they should be using and where, the designer can manage what attributes are available through design tokens. Here's an example of that. In the same way we compile tokens for our web and mobile frameworks, we can also compile tokens for a palette to be consumed by design tools. Um, as an example, the craft plugin for Sketch accepts a JSON format, which can be generated by Theo output, which sets color, font, spacing, etc. in Sketch. This makes it simple to align designer assets with the output that is used to build the public facing resource. If you think GitHub as a store for your token repository, designers can make changes and submit pull requests to update tokens that power the design system. This decouples developers from the sorry, decouples developers from the curation of design tokens entirely and leaves it in the hands of the designers. We've had success this sort of approach to our content strategy. Um, one of our projects at Shopify, moving the app content to resource files, allows her to make changes without any developer intervention. Uh, this streamlines our ability to make content changes and save developers time and, and eventually money that we will spend on other tasks. So we want to allow designers to make design decisions and developers to make implementation decisions. Designers should be asking themselves, what choice do I make? Choosing the best options that define the look, feel, and behavior of the system. Developers can then ask, what options do I have available? Applying the available options to the specific context. So let's take a quick look at the FIO integration. This is getting a bit more technical, but we'll try to keep it fairly high level. Um, so let's run through some examples quickly here of how we can do that. So the first way of doing it is using the command line integration, um, sorry, the command interface for Theo that is offered by the Theo library. Uh, it's a pretty typical CLI interface, offers some input and output options along with formatting, destination folder options. Uh, that could be baked into your package.json as an NPM script. Uh, it makes it fairly straightforward to build your tokens as part of a compilation process and makes it transparent to developers. Uh, this example creates a build tokens task which takes, <laughs> compiles two token files into SCSS for our app style sheets. Salesforce also created a gulp plugin for Theo, which is the primary means of compiling design tokens in the Lightning design system. Uh, if you don't know what gulp is, gulp is a tool for automating the build process with a little more control over what happens during the build process compared to something like Webpack. The benefit of gulp Theo is that it is extremely customizable. You can register your own format templates using the handlebars templating language to map design tokens to any use case you can imagine. This could be something like a sketch craft plugin like I mentioned earlier, or create an output file for another language not supported natively by Theo, something like Ruby or PHP or something that's not supported out of the box. Uh, this is an example of compiling design tokens into a JavaScript array format, retaining in-context in comments if available for each token. So in closing, Design tokens help system, design systems scale beyond a single platform. They give designers ownership over the atomic visual design attributes that define the system, how it looks and behaves. And finally, using Theo, they can streamline the development practices to keep designers engaged in the code base, uh, engaged with the code base and keep developer time focused on development. Just a couple of resources here. Uh, we'll put these slides online later, I believe, and you can take a look at those. Uh, I've got the Polaris libraries up there. Uh, both the public facing uh, one that Amy talked about earlier, as well as our direct source version, uh, Theo, Gulf Theo, and Bootstrap's uh, design library, Get Repo. Thanks, everyone. Values, consistent user feedback. Um, and in terms of Polaris, um, we actually have a place where anybody uh, can file issues. They don't have to work at Shopify. Um, so if there are third-party developers who are trying to use Polaris and they're running into problems or they have ideas, they can file an issue and the team here will look at the issue and, and respond and make adjustments accordingly. Great question. 
Anyone else? Can you talk a little bit about how you took inventory for the tangible and non-tangible uh, things in your design system? Like, did you use any tools? Um, we basically just used a spreadsheet. So inventories are things that content strategists love. Um, and we use them often to just make a list of all, for example, the language uh, in a certain website or app or experience to get a sense of where things are consistent and where things aren't. So to be honest, we just used a simple uh, Google Doc spreadsheet, um, started kind of maintaining a list of things, started looking across, and we had um, at one point a thing we called the Document Depot, which was essentially a Google Doc with a whole bunch of links to all the relevant things in our vault, uh, so that we were able to kind of organize them and get a bird's eye view of all the stuff that existed. So it was very lo-fi. So how long uh, did you guys spend on the initial release of Polaris, and how big was your team? Um, well, so from the time we decided we wanted to launch a style guide to the time that we launched it, it was actually very short. So it was, uh, so we have an internal event that the whole company goes to every year, and last year it was the third week of January. Um, we announced there that we were going to do it, and then we launched the style guide at Unite which I think was April 24th last year. So it was a pretty quick process, um, but we weren't starting from scratch. We had a lot of resources already there. We had um, an internal component library. Um, we had some content standards, but it was really a matter of looking across all of these different things that we had and figuring out what, would, what worked, what didn't work, what we needed to adjust and fix, um, and also the stuff that we really wanted to add that didn't exist and then putting it all together in an intentional way. Um, so what is that? How many months is that? Four months? Three months? Um, and then in terms of how big the team was, uh, the core team working on it was probably including content strategy, design, uh, front-end development, I don't know, probably like 10 to 15 people working, working pretty consistently on it. It was a really big endeavor, and, and actually you can probably speak to this part better than I can, but um, we were also moving to uh, have our components available in React, which, as I understand it, is a, was a fairly big endeavor, <laughs> and I'm not well equipped to speak about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I wasn't here for that yet, so I started the week after this was released pretty much. I missed all the initial build. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry guys. Uh, but yeah, it's been um, nice work with React Components because it's, it's a fairly modern and modular way of building things. So a lot of our components are building on other components inside the system. So when we build a new, say, let's say we build a uh, file input component, we would then leverage our buttons and our other pieces of the system that are also React Components. So we're always building on what we built before. It's been a nice change of pace rather than trying to have direct markup for everything separately. Who's next? Anyone else? Huh? Uh, this notion of uh, design token is uh, the Shopify invention, or have you have been inspired by some other technology? Design tokens. Design tokens. That's a, uh, it's kind of a thing off in the ether, but Salesforce has been championing that. Uh, we're just starting to look at how we can integrate that into our web stack and how we can get that into our development process. Um, this is going to be looked at a little bit over the holidays, and it's starting some traction this year. Uh, so stay tuned to that on the players' repos, and there'll be something up there at some point, I imagine. Yeah, one of the things, like, what design tokens ultimately gets you is the ability to have a multi-brand uh, framework. You know, if you want to change uh, all of the kind of visual design and, and presentation of a component, it's really hard to do if it's all baked into the component, which is uh, the way that Polaris works right now. So if we wanted to have a different, you know, brand for Polaris, you would do so through like a design token library. Okay, so let's give a round of applause again for our three fantastic speakers. Thank you. Uh, so that wraps up Shop by Sessions. Uh, feel free to stick around for a little bit longer. There's still lots of food, so please take some. Uh, you can take a whole thing of it if you'd like. I don't want it in this office. Uh, the next Shop by Sessions is the 
third Wednesday of February, which is the 21st, if I looked at the calendar correctly. Topic is still TBD. If you have things that you would like to hear about, please come find me and tell me your ideas. Uh, otherwise, thanks for coming out.